So if I'm using a pass sequence to uh, do in-place upgrades, I usually have at least two of it. So I would have one sequence that just does the, the validation. So this was an upgrade sequence that we need to should take it this sequence. You can see it actually doesn't do much. It just verifies that the system has some basic specs fulfilled. Memory, enough disk space, UFI mode, and all that good stuff. Why do some organizations still do it? Well, sometimes it's out of pure habit of always doing so. The main reason is often due to time, how long it takes to deploy something. But it could also be that we actually still need it. Uh, for example, I'm working with a few uh, educational organizations. They deploy lab environments for their students. Those images can be uh, 75 gigs in size, hundreds of applications in the computer or on the PCs. But here are the, the, the command line switch that you can throw to set up if you want to do a fake upgrade. It means run only the compatibility scan and tell me if this machine at least have a fighting chance of being uh, upgraded. And this one is going to spit out the return code. This would be the return code for happiness. This is one of the most common failures. It usually means that you have a service or application or something running on the box that the setup you definitely do not like. Add a download package content action to your sequence that downloads the drivers to a custom path. And then you set a variable named this to that path like here. So one step to download the driver, one step to set the variable, and then the native step in config manager will happily upgrade those drivers. During. It copies that file to this folder in Windows. And as long as that file is there, Windows now knows which profile it's supposed to use. So either you can go into Intune and assign a profile to a group and add the machine to a group, or you can download the profile and stage it on the device as part of your... So what happens now is that the connector is actually asking your domain controller for an offline domain object. And the domain controller is sending that to Intune and in turn sends it down to your PC. Additional MDT sequence and enable it for autopilot. And it doesn't matter if it's a config manager sequence or an MDT sequence, the sequence is the sequence, but it's basically a script that does the registration for you. So instead of doing what I showed you, where I gathered the hardware hash myself, and I uploaded it to the Intune tenant, you can have a PowerShell script that does all of that. And over the years, some of these, not all of them, but a few, have turned out to be valuable to have support for in, in config man environments. For example, config man for the longest time didn't support regional settings very well in the sequence. So there was a script that dealt with that, that you got from the end integration. You get a development framework, you get a simulation environment. If you're trying to deploy software like these guys here, Autodesk, 3D Studio Max, they are fairly large, but above all, they have thousands and tens of thousands of small files in the package. It takes a really long time to download can take hours if it's an HTTPS connection. Because the content is not very big per se, just that it has so many different files. You can put apps in WIM files and have the wrapper, instead of starting setup XE something, first mount the WIM and then start setup XE. Config Manager actually comes with two Pixie responders. 
I recommend to use the new one. It's lightweight, it's fast, and it can run on both servers and clients. Whereas the old responder that was based on WDS requires a server. So select all these boxes because this one is the one that creates that WDS less. When using um, your own media, these scenarios here, sure, uh, the deployment was faster, but all the content came from a DP. And in the cloud imaging case, that is a cost. That is those 40, 50 cents, unless the content was peer to peer. It becomes one. quite interesting in the way we transfer this content. Because for example, if you guys spin up a cloud management gateway and you do by metal deployment imaging through it, you are now paying for download. And it's a good 40, 50 cents to download a full five, six gig image from a CMD. So imagine that you're pulling a hundred machines in an office. Well, it's now adds up to a cost of $50. There was a question regarding authentication. So how does WinP sort of get access to the content on the cloud management gateway? Uh, well, there is a certificate injected in the boot image for a start when it's being created. But also each of these, I, think I can show you in the log file actually, uh, because you will see they have a really strange URL when it's downloading stuff, like here. So this is a URL that contains uh, the secret sauce that allows it to access content in an Azure blob storage. You can see here that it's not going to stop serve content until the disk queue length is 10 and the CPU is 80. So it just start to pour, pour out content until one of these conditions is met. And I can tell you a client machine that is averaging 80% CPU and a disk queue length of 10, you, you can't even use that machine. I tried to open Notepad. It took like half a minute to open Notepad. It's simply a PowerShell script that you point out where your boot image is, where you install Dart, and it adds it the right way to the boot image. And it adds it in such a way so that you can even connect to it before typing in the password in the boot image. Bottom line, that set up one VM, configure the capture, the card for destination, set up a new one for pixie testing, you set that one as source, and then you watch out for uh, the Wireshark, you put a filter for boot P, which is the technology or platform or, or the protocol that is used for, um, for pixie, and you should be able to see what's going on.